here. I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, it stems from this really long history of taking whatever technology we currently have that's at the forefront and making metaphors of that technology to our brains. So back when like the steam engine was a big thing, I know Freud and whoever were talking about like pressure release valves with our psychology um, and our urges and stuff. And then when we got just regular computers, um, when they became mainstream, everyone wanted to assume that like our logic reasoning processes, like our actual computation or our, our brains was similar to that of actual computers, which was just silly. Um, we're, we are not digital in that sense, um, but they were trying to make comparisons to that. Um, the older versions before deep learning of uh, AI attempted to actually go based off that. They tried to make logical representations of the world and act based off that, and it was just silly. Um, but there's, there's a long history of comparing uh, the current state-of-the-art tech, the new craze, to the way our brain works. Um, we're comparing our brain to it, I should say. So... This one, let's get to it. Learning beyond sensations, how dreams organize neuronal representations. Here we suggest that virtual experiences may be just as relevant as actual sensory inputs in shaping cortical representations. Um, so let's go through past that to make it clear what I just said. By trying to match the sensory evoke signal, the brain thus seeks for latent causes that would best characterize the stimulus, such as its semantic category. Through these processes, brains can learn organized mental representations. Um, what was it trying to say here? I, I should have highlighted more, I bet. The, the problem with this um, this background info is just a whole lot of neuroscience stuff they're talking about, um, and it's all pretty dense and wanted to feed on each other, and I was trying to just highlight some quick pieces. Um, but so what was that sentence saying again? By trying to, I know I had a thought on it. By trying to match the sensory evoked signal, the brain thus seeks for latent causes. Oh, oh principles of predictive learning. Okay, so our, our brain is constantly trying to predict what we're about to see. The reason being, there's a delay from an actual event happening to when you can actually process it and react um, when your muscles can move. Um, I think it's like 200 milliseconds, best of my memory, don't quote me on that. Um, but like our, our brains fundamentally work in like a, a delayed sense. We are constantly trying to predict what's about to happen in the next few milliseconds. Um, and by trying to match the sensory evoked signal, the brain thus seeks for latent causes that would best characterize the stimulus. So what this means is that because we have this delay and because we're trying to match the sensory evoked signal, we have had to evolve a causal representation, an actual meaningful semantic causal representation of the world around us. Um, cool. Neuronal dynamics and synaptic plasticity are both involved in learning generative models of the environment. Um, yeah. First, on short time scales, neuronal activities change to better predict the evoked activity. Second, on longer time scales, synaptic plasticity aims to further improve this prediction. Over time, minimization of prediction errors through these dynamics implicitly organize the latent representations. Um, I think over time means as growing up, um, uh, short time scales, an individual neuron can change slowly or, or not so slowly, I guess. It's activation potential, it's um, threshold, activation threshold. Whereas on longer time scales, you want like complete rewiring of the brain is the idea here. And over time, we do get that. Predictive learning principles thus suggest a computational model compatible with cortical structure and activity for learning in brains from a simple goal, predicting sensory evoked low-level cortical activities. Um, this is great. So uh, this is the thing I've been thinking about for a while is right now transformers are bottom up. They take in sensory inputs and they give out an output. I think to actually get a really good consciousness similar loop going, I think part of an element of consciousness is we need a top-down system. We need to send the outputs or the prediction back down to be used as input in a loop. Um, and I have some ideas as to how to structure that. That's actually one of my ideas for my first um, models to make, um, but we'll see how that goes a few months away, I think. Um, but the idea being top-down information from what we expect to happen, our prediction is pretty important. As soon as we reduce external sensory inputs, for instance, through unfocusing our eyes, meditation, or deep rest, we can become aware of virtual experiences continuously produced by our brain. 
these manifest in their strongest form as dreams. So that's what I was saying. So a virtual experience, what they're calling it, is just any kind of creation of the brain as opposed to input into the brain. Despite the fact that we spend a significant portion of our lives exposed to such virtual experiences, they merely appear as epiphenomenon in predictive learning theories. We hypothesize in the following that brains indeed derive essential learning signals from such internally generated virtual experiences. So they're going to attempt to explain why it is and how it is and what's useful about dreams. Why do we dream? Um, and they're going to use ideas from current deep learning theory um, to interpret. And here we go. Generative adversarial networks introduce an architecture that consists of two networks, a generator producing virtual samples and a discriminator judging whether a sample is real or generated. These two networks are trained adversarially, with the discriminator learning to distinguish generated from real samples, while the generator learns to fool the discriminator by improving the realism of the generated samples. So adversarialism, we literally have two separate models kind of fighting each other. One's trying to create fake data and fool the other one, and the other one's trying to figure out which data is real, which is fake, um, and uh, not be fooled by the first. Um, and the idea here, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it when the highlights show up, but he's gonna, they're going to relate this to dreams, basically. GANs are known to extract semantic latent representations from data. Um, basically, uh, they're saying that these adversarial networks are pretty good at finding um, cause representations, actual semantic meaningful information. Um, they're pretty efficient. They're used in many different places. Adversarial learning principles have been hypothesized to allow the brain to learn semantic representations from creative dreams, typically occurring during REM sleep. In this study, the authors propose a cortical architecture with a feedback pathway that generates activity in early sensory cortex from high level representations. Additionally, they introduce a feed-forward pathway that determines whether activity in lower sensory cortices is externally driven or internally generated. Feed-forward pathways thus assume the role of the discriminator in GANs. So basically, your dreams occur because your brain is creating purposely false information from your memories um, so that it can learn how to distinguish between the false info it generates and the real-world info. Um, and doing so... Uh, allows for, we have creative dreams that we're going to get into that in a little bit, I think. Um, but it allows you kind of to like concretize, concretize, so to solidify um, separate semantic ideas in your brain, um, in your hippocampus. Learning in this model is organized across three different physiological phases, wakefulness, non-rapid eye movement, and REM sleep, each characterized by a different objective. During REM sleep, two different representations from previously observed stimuli are retrieved and together with cortical background activity, generate a creative dream through feedback pathways. I just zoned out for that. What was, what was that? Um, three phases. We're focusing on REM sleep. And that's the GAN is during REM sleep. Observed stimuli are retrieved from your memory and together with cortical background activity, so random stochastic stuff happening, generate a creative dream through feedback pathways. Feedback pathways are trained to adversarially fool the feedforward discriminator into believing that the activity in early sensory areas is externally driven. This process defines adversarial dreaming. We'll get into the implications of this. So when you're awake, you actually see something that comes in in your uppermost layers, I guess, chat discriminate. Is it from outside or from inside, um, from dreams? And if it's from outside, they send it to a memory kind of thing, right? Whereas when you're sleeping, your memories, um, there's like a top-down process. I think, so this top-down process, this this down arrow right here, is actually always happening. Um, but it's it's used as a prediction framework to help you react more quickly to the real world phenomenon, right? But when you're sleeping, there is no actual input from the outside world. It's just the top-down process. And so they... Well, um, what your brain does is it uses, it um, combines memories and everything, makes up some stuff, combines them, and then says, this is fake data. Let's see if our real world sen object sensing pathways can figure that out. Um, so, and it basically gives your uh, bottom up processes the task of distinguish between dream and real. Um, and that's the reason why you forget dreams is your bottom-up processes say like, 
that was a dream. Let's forget it kind of thing. And that's them getting better. Um, but conversely, uh, creativity is kind of the whole idea of combination of different ideas, different memories. So it's useful to remember your dreams there. They can, they can provide new ideas and stuff. Um, so I don't know. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, there's cause this, with the whole dream thing and creativity, the dynamic is certainly, and the fact that like top down is always happening, the d- dynamic is certainly more complex than this graphic shows right here. But so this graphic is a subset of what's actually happening that they're discussing this paper right now. The results from this model suggest that REM created dreams generated through adversarial dreaming become more realistic over learning, but still remain different and novel as compared to external sensory inputs. Um, I've experienced this. I don't know about you, but as I've gotten older, my dreams get more complex, more ideas in there. They tend to have mine have full plot lines nowadays. Like there's full rising action, um, resolution, everything. Um, and they get weirder and weirder too. Um, but also more realistic feeling. Um, like I don't think I used to taste when I dreamt, but I, maybe I did. I don't know, but I definitely have like tasted things in dreams recently. That's like, that was like, I wasn't imagining that maybe like I thought I tasted something like I, had the sensory feeling of taste for sure um so they get more complex over time as you learn more the authors thus conclude that creative dreams are a key ingredient for the acquisition of semantic latent representations we expect that in subjects who are chronically deprived of REM sleep they are less semantically organized than for control subjects behaviorally this would translate as slower learning speed of novel object classification tasks um, I'm pretty sure this is true. I'm pretty sure like if you don't sleep, you're not going to learn very well. That's like a thing. Um, so that aligns pretty well too. Dreams should become more realistic with age. This correlates with dream reports over different stages of life. So it's not just me, I guess. According to the theory, this reflects that older persons know more about the structure of the world and its limitations and thus become more cons- conservative and less prone to exploration, reducing their capacity to learn new concepts. This is interesting. Like, so like like little kid dreams are wacky, crazy, right? Like there's just every concept thrown around. Um, whereas you go to an adult stream, like my mom just like dreams about her next work day. Like that's like she like in, to be fair, she actually um is conscious during her dreams. Like she actually control them a little bit. So that's part of, part of her doing. But like her dreams don't have unicorns or anything. They are very much just like they, she plans out her day in her dreams. Um, so that's the difference between like kids and adults kind of thing. It's kind of crazy. Uh, generating semantic superpositions and expo- so com- combining ideas basically and exposing the feed forward pathways to these may equip the agent with the ability to quickly recognize new stimuli as a composition of known components. What this is saying is like most things you experience um, in the world that are new are actually just combinations of things you've already experienced to some degree. Um, you know, the, the brain is based off metaphor, off a, off combination, um, and existence itself is just combination of smaller and smaller parts to increasing complexity. Um, so this, this process, these feed forward pathways equip the agent with the ability to quickly recognize new stimuli as a composite of node components. So if you are constantly in your dreams, seeing new crazy things, it'll make you better at seeing new crazy things when you're not dreaming and reacting to them accurately so basically it basically dreaming allows our intelligence to become more generalized novel adversarially generated experiences could provide an unexpected solution to a specific problem the agent is facing yeah eureka moments from dreams that's that's a thing um i've had some of those the idea of semantic latent representations is to have similar latent neuronal responses to semantically similar stimuli. Oh, so this is a different thing now. We're just not discussing. We're discussing contrastive learning now, whereas before was adversarial dreaming. This is contrastive learning. The idea of semantic latent representations is to have similar latent neuronal responses to semantically similar stimuli, instead of learning representations implicitly via generative models. I need some water. Am I watering? Oh, whatever. I don't. Instead of learning representations implicitly via generative models, one could directly train feed-forward pathways to map semantically similar inputs to similar latent representations and dissimilar inputs to different regions of the latent space. In this context, one often refers to similar positive examples as being pulled together and dissimilar negative examples as being pushed apart from each other during the training process. 
so we're about to go basically we're about to go into a, um an explanation of how like um for memories our brain takes things that are related in their meaning and in their existence and pulls them together in our brains and it takes things that are separate and dissimilar and pushes them apart um uh kind of like like one of these things basically um contrastive dreaming Contrastive learning principles may be leveraged by the brain to enhance and robustify neuronal representations during imagination and dreaming. So positive REM phase, what do we have going on here? Um, the cat, you dream about the cat, um, and it pulls together. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So there's this thing that, that um, vision models do, right? Where you have only so much data, you have only so many photos of horses, okay? And you want to make the model better able to generalize to photos of horses that are not in your data set. And that's hard to do because like you only have your data set, right? So what people do with this data is they uh, they apply simple transformations to it. They like um, 90 degree rotation, uh, they like stretch it, they'll like change the color by a little bit, uh, they'll add some camera fuzz they'll like only show half the photo they'll cut it off um, basically they the idea is to stochastically edit your actual data to create artificial data that is not like actual um it's not like the exact same as the photos of horses your model will encounter in the real world post training but because they are different from your general data from your actual data set it does and they're indifferent in meaningful ways a little bit but still close enough it allows your model to better generalize the photos it's going to see that, that are not similar to your actual raw data um, so what's happening here take your memory of a cat send it down the top down process so you're, you're dreaming of a cat and this dream kind of edits your memories of your cats it combines them mixes matches them stretches them twists them sideways um, add some different color or, or fuzz or something makes it fuzzy and it sends that back up and back up the chain and now you take that edited version of your cat memory and you pull that idea to your cat memory, like closer together to your cat memory kind of thing so basically the idea is that your brain's doing the exact same thing here as vision um, researchers do to their data sets to like edit things slightly is like when you dream about one thing or when there's like one thing in your dream that's like a process that's happening is um you are uh basically increasing the strength of and increasing the generality of a given memory and a given idea a given um concept in your head that you have um same thing here with push apart so whenever you dream about cats you twist the cat and um, change its color a little bit and whatever send it back up um, that edited version of a cat, that edited photo of a cat still does not look like a car. And so therefore push apart the cat and the car ideas in your head. In contrastive dreaming, only a single hippocampal memory serves as the basis for subsequent genera generation of dreamed activity in early sensory cortex. Instead of combining multiple stored memories, the virtual experiences thus represent previously observed sensory inputs that are altered by a series of augmentations. These augmentations need to be strong enough to change the low-level details of the virtual experience, but not so strong as to change the semantic content. Example, adding noise to, blurring, cropping, rotating, or distorting an image. The goal of feed-forward pathways then consists of mapping this altered augmented input to its original hippocampal representation, thus pulling together positive pairs. That's all that I just said. Do, 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 do. Summary, outlook, relation to previous work. The consequences of a dysfunctional or a dysfunctioning discriminator on the perception of hallucinations leading to potential delusions observed in mental disorders. Okay, oh, yeah, so the idea here is that if you have schizophrenia, um, you are you have a dysfunctional um, discriminator, a dysfunctional ability to tell the difference between um, actual sensory inputs and what your brain is just hallucinating creating um, relatable this view significantly expands our perspective on perception and learning do we need to be constantly focused on our sensorium to learn optimally or can we finally justify sometimes having our heads in the clouds yes yes thank you please 
think I said earlier, maybe in this video, maybe the like previous video, I've been recording videos back to back right now. Um, but I said at some point, the way I'm learning right now is reading these papers, obviously highlighting whatever, and then I give it a night's rest. I dream. I let my brain process what's happening. Next day, I come to this video. Purpose of these videos is for me to like act like I'm teaching somebody, is to talk out loud, explain what's happening in the paper, show that I understand it. Um, and I think the dreaming process, the, the overnight storage process is crucial to understanding. If I were to record this video yesterday when I actually read this paper, when I actually read it, it would not go as well. I would not have given you any of this, these good explanations kind of thing right now. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I think part, so like this is, this is a reason why like you shouldn't be pulling all nighters before a test. Um, you, you shouldn't be just running through memorizing stuff like, like proper learning, um, involves dreaming, involves imagination, involves creativity, um, involves giving it time, all this stuff. Um, that's, I think all the thoughts I had, I do want to say that like, I, my, part of my motivation for reading this paper was that, um, I want to implement a top down process into transformers. I want to have a backwards direction going. Um, so look out for that in six months or something is the goal. But, um, other than that, yeah, end of video.